morning, everyone. So we've made it to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And we were picking up speed for a little while there. No idea how long it's going to take us to finish the chapter. Um, because Paul is arriving at Ephesus, or the far side of Ephesus, and he's going to meet with the Ephesian elders. And this is just a, a rich, heartwarming, um, sad, um, bittersweet goodbye that he's going to have with these elders. And so it is a very rich and moving text and, and fun to go through. So let's dive in. We'll see what we get done today and we'll see what the Lord wants to speak to us. Acts chapter 20, verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always live among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That sounds like a nice place to stop. So, hey everyone. Once again, if you said hi and I wasn't looking. So Paul gets there and he begins to testify of his ministry at Ephesus and just all that went on while he was there, that he served them in many trials and in many tears. And, you know, there's there's just a lot, I'm sure, that went on while he was there in Ephesus. And, and he got to know those people, and there was an intimacy, and there was a nearness, and a closeness, and, and there was love. And the church, it sounds like, was being the church. It was the, looking the way it was supposed to look, with ministry going on all week long. You'll notice it says he was going from house to house, publicly moving from place to place. So it's, he's going in the public. He's going to the houses. Christians are just getting together and they're sharing in fellowship, sharing in brotherhood. And it's a beautiful thing. When the church becomes the church, it's no longer you know, a thing we do or a place we go. It's something we're a part of, and, and the church is our family. And so these are the people that we spend our time with. This is the who we get together with, who we think about, what we share with, who we come to when we need help or when we want to share praise. And so it's just this beautiful picture uh, of that taking place. And, and again, from yesterday, we mentioned how Paul knew <laughs> that he had to get to Jerusalem. And so he sails past Ephesus because he knew if he actually stopped in the city that there'd be no way to avoid all the people wanting to talk and get together and share. And so he's like, I got, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna have to sail past and just bring the elders out so I can give them some marching orders and send them away with information that they're going to need. But he kept nothing back that was helpful. You know, that was his whole point. He wanted to grow these people. He wanted to strengthen them. He wanted to make a strong church. And so Paul was sharing with them, not always just the fun stuff, but he would also share the stuff that would push them and that would challenge them. And sometimes we don't like it when we're pushed or challenged. But you know, church isn't supposed to be a place where we just hear a bunch of things that make us feel good. It's the things that are really in the end, they're going to be helpful. We read in the word, blessed are the wounds of a friend. Paul's going to say, and probably where we'll get to on Monday, the idea that he did not, uh, he shared the whole counsel of God with them, right? He did not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. And the idea was that 
he, he said the easy stuff, the comforting stuff, and the challenging stuff, and the stuff that rubs us wrong and reveals to us the work that we still have yet to do in our faith as we're growing. And so he didn't hold back anything that was helpful. He testified repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. So as he preached there while he was in Ephesus, he continued to preach repentance, that we need to turn from our sins, that we can't just keep living the way we've always lived and call ourselves Christians, that we truly have to turn from a life of sin and turn to God. And no amount of church attendance or giving or anything can replace repentance. You see, repentance is what turning to God is. It's not faith plus repentance. They're, they're, they're more joined than that. They're like two sides of a coin. And when you turn the face towards God, the back is turned towards sin. There's, there's no and repentance, really. It's, it's part of the package. When you make Jesus your Lord, you're choosing to obey your Lord. If Jesus isn't Lord, well, then it's not faith and it's not salvation. That's the idea is turning to him. We turn our back on the things of the world. So he was sure to make sure he continued to preach on repentance while he was there. And I like in verse 24, probably a highlight of what we read this morning. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to finish my race. I would hope that you want to finish your race. That the ministry I've received from Jesus Christ, that's the idea that we all have been called to ministry, that God made you with a purpose and that you weren't an accident, that in fact you have a place in his church. The church might not require a building where people meet on Sundays. It, it's, it's bigger than that. And there's the body of Christ where everyone has a role and we're part of the body. And, and so often we see the body of Christ suffering because um, some people just don't want to be a part of the body unless they get to be the part they want to be. And so imagine, I mean, how many parts of the body, unless we might have a doctor watching with us, but how many of us, right? I mean, can you think of how many body parts and, and parts inside the body that we don't even know the name of, right? I mean, I can... I don't even know how many body parts there are that I probably don't know the proper name for all the little tiny things that do things I'm totally unaware of. But I'll tell you this, that if one of them was removed from my body, I would instantly become aware of this missing body part that didn't seem important before. You see, when the body of Christ is healthy, it's when all the parts of the body start finding out, God made me to encourage people. That might not be my role, but maybe you. I hope I'm encouraging, but you know what I mean. That, that God made some Christians with a gift of encouragement. And their job is to encourage other believers. You see, someone called to evangelism might go out and be discouraged by how their, their, their evangelist, evangelism you know, trip went. And when they come back, they might be tempted to not go out and fulfill their part in the body of Christ because of the discouragement. But here's this person who's gifted in encouragement. And so they're encouraging them, right? Some of us are good with our hammers and our rulers and all that kind of stuff. And so when we do a church work party, we're there using those gifts God has given us. And I see Diane's with us because it's Saturday. And, and Diane is typically downstairs preparing lunch for us all because she's got a gift of ministering to fellow believers. She might not work a hammer, maybe she does, but, but, but that's the thing is this is where we all come together and all of our gifts now create a synergy and we're able to accomplish things we'd never be able to do by ourselves. So Paul has his, his gift 
we all have a gift that we should be figuring out what it is. And Paul's whole goal is that he may finish his race with joy. I.e., I found out why God made me, and then my life began to revolve around why God made me. That truly, my job is just to pay the bills. My purpose in life is this, that I have these priorities in ministry done. Some great cross-references, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, and we'll just have two little cross-references to wrap up today. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, verse 24, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. He's talking about if you're an athlete, you watch an Olympian and they go on a diet. They have an exercise regimen. Why? Because they actually see a prize set before them and they're willing to revolve their life around this prize. And it says, now they, they do it for a perishable crown, but we're doing this for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. I'm not just messing around. Like I've got a plan and I'm sticking to my plan. Thus, I fight, not as one who beats against the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. And this now ties into his calling, lest when I preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And he didn't want to be disqualified from his calling, from his place in the body of Christ. Here we see him telling them, hey, when I was with you, I, I, I served you. I didn't hold things back so that I may finish my race. Here, writing to the Corinthians, he's telling them, man, this is, this is how you run the race so that you may obtain the prize. And then you can go to the last epistle we have of Paul to the last chapter that he wrote and really one of the last bits of teachings we have from him, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And he says that I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Paul got to the end of his race. He believed, I believe he was set free, and then you know, that's another history story for later, but that he was going to be beheaded any day. And he writes this letter. I made it. I actually made it to the end of life, and I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I did that which God created me to do. Some people are called to be pastors. Some people are called to love music and serve on the worship team. And other people are called to love music and they mix sound. Other people are encouragers. The Bible actually says that some are called to give liberally, that giving money is actually one of God's purpose in their life. And perhaps those are the same people whom God will bless financially because he also knows they're gonna give liberally. There's all these things that, that it takes to make the body of Christ function. And so Paul's talking about living life in such a way that we may have that great prize. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We should all want to hear that. And if God has called you to be an encourager, you may enter into heaven with more prize and more rewards than many a preacher who did not run his race as faithfully if God has called, and I do believe he calls some to very specific ministries of prayer and intercession, that faithful prayer is what God has called these people to. And they will enter into heaven with more rewards. You see, in the parable of the minas is where God is, talks about, Jesus says that he gives one mina to everyone and they go and invest. And the one who made 10 minas got tenfold reward and the one who made five minas got a five-fold reward. The point is, is whatever gift God has given you, he expects you to use it and multiply it. And if you're called to this part or that part, wherever it is, if you're faithful to what God has called you, you will be rewarded accordingly. And remember from the parable of the talents, to the one he gave 10 talents, that guy had 10 talents. He made 10 more. To the one he gave five talents, that guy made five more. They were given equal reward. Why? 
because he doubled what he was given. He was given less, but he too doubled what he was given. So God rewards them evenly. So whatever you've been given, just multiply. Don't worry about how much you've been given. Just worry and think, Lord, I want to run this race. And so I'm going to make choices and I'm going to live my life in such a way and I'm going to discipline myself because I'm fighting for a prize and it's waiting for me in heaven. And I want to hear it when I step through. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little and I'm going to put you over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I'm excited and I hope that I can be faithful with what's been given to me. And I think God has given me many great gifts. And so I'm all the more responsible to multiply those things. Whether you feel like you've been given much or little, multiply what you've been given. He's given you a passion for it. He's given you a natural inclination to it. Take that and just figure out how can I use this to bless and edify the body of Christ. That is why God made you do it. Have an amazing weekend. Hope to see some of you guys at church. Hope to see all you guys at a church. Go where you gotta go where you have to go. If your church is closed, because I know a bunch of people watch you, their churches are closed. Go to a different church, even if it's just temporary, right? But go to a church. There are open churches everywhere. Even where there's no churches open, I have friends who are going, you know, to jail because they're holding church. So you can still go. <laughs> God bless you guys. Have an amazing Saturday. Take care.